close to the end. Very close to the end. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. We're close to the end. We'll start with verse 1 here. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. In two days, in two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. So like I said, we're, we're getting close to the end here. Um, the, the journey that Jesus is walking on earth, the account of it is coming close to the end. Um, we, we, the, the, the the death, the crucifixion of Jesus is imminent, right? Up to now, when he has spoken of his crucifixion, of his death, he has spoken of it as something that is to come, something that's in the future, without a definite time. The Son of Man is going to be given over, the Son of Man is going to be crucified, he will be reviled. He says all this, but this time, he says, after two days is a Passover. So he's got a time now. He's telling them, in two days, this is gonna happen. Um, and, you know, I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine for Jesus what it's like to be looking at his death, knowing that it's coming. And he knows, he knows what day it's coming on, right? So he's looking to that. And, and we're, we're coming to the end. And today, the sermon, the title of the sermon, if you look at your bulletins, the title is, Is It I? Is It I? And, and as we're looking at Jesus and him coming close to his death, we're going to be looking at three groups of people and how they act and behave around Jesus. And the question I would like us all to ask in our own hearts is, would I be like this? Would I be someone like this? Would I do something like this? Um, and so, let's go into three groups. First group, verse three to five. Then the chief priests, scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Okay, so this first group, this first group is the religious leaders. Right? And I've said it time and again, and I'm going to say it again because it always bears repeating. Our faith, our faith is not a religion. Christianity is not merely a religion. It is a relationship with the living God. And the problem with these religious leaders is they could not see the God that they worshipped was standing right here in front of them in the flesh. Right? So for them, their faith was all about a religion, a set of doctrines, a set of things to do without a real relationship. So no wonder then when God himself comes in the flesh and stands in front of them, they can't see, they can't see it, right? And so these religious leaders, they, they're accusing Jesus of blasphemy. And here it says they're plotting to take Jesus by trickery and kill him, right? This word trickery, in the original text, it, it denotes um, not so much that they're gonna say, you know, they're, they're gonna trick Jesus into a trap, but they're going to be subtle and deceitful in how to take him. It is going to be something that is not public, right? They don't want to take Jesus publicly. They don't want to end up making a spectacle out of him. They want this to be done away with quietly. And so they want, and ever since, ever since Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, right? If you look at the account in the book of John, ever since Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, these religious leaders have been plotting on how to kill him. And now, at the Passover feast, they finally get together and they start figuring out how they're gonna do this. Um, and they wanted to go away with it quietly, but they didn't. At least as of these verses, they didn't. Why? Why did they stop? Is it because they, they feared possibly killing an innocent man? Right? Because I think as much as they hated him, they didn't really know for sure what they could pin on Jesus. And so by the law, he would be an innocent man. But this wasn't what stopped them. If you notice what, what the verse we just read said, they said, not during the feast. We're not going to take Jesus during the feast. Why? lest there be an uproar among the people, right? They stop not because of they might be doing something wrong. They stop because they were afraid of how people would react. Now, we look at this first group of people, look at this passage, and, and you know, we're you're sitting there thinking, no way, no way, that's not me, because I, I wouldn't do this. I would never plot to kill Jesus. I would never... 
I would never imagine to do something so so drastic, something so atrocious, right? And then obviously, obviously we're here, we love the Lord, we're not going to plot to kill Jesus, right? But I think there's other similarities we can draw from the behavior of these religious leaders. The question I have is how often, how often do we determine what we do or don't do based on who will see us? How often do we decide what we will do or not do based on who is watching? And I think this is something we need to really think about. It's something very relevant. Um, you know, when, when I went to camp a few, two weeks, it feels like a long time ago, right? Three weeks ago, I went to camp. And our whole family went, Alice and Zoe came back early. And when Alice was leaving, she said, you know, you're gonna have a lot more free time on your hands, so make yourself useful. Help out around the camp, right? Um, there's groundskeepers at the camp. This year, there were not many of them. One of them is 83 years old, right? And so I, I decided to tag along with Brother Bob and help him out. And, you know, as we're doing these chores, like he, he's, I'm getting tired, right? But here he is, 83 years old, and he's chugging along, so it's like, well, I can't really complain. I gotta keep going. But one of the tasks I tried to do was, um, if you, if you, you know the camp now. Uh, did you go to the beach? But you saw it, right? There's a little stretch of beach at the lake, and the first year I went, I remember, you know, we'd be out there, and I was there digging holes with all the kids, and we'd be making a mess. And the next day, when we go out there, the beach is nice and flat again. And I always thought, wow, the waves from the lake must be really powerful coming in at night and smoothing everything out. I found out this year, that's part of the groundskeeper's work. They go out there every morning before everyone else is up with their rakes. They rake all the seaweed and, and pine needles that have washed up on shore. And then all the holes that these kids have dug, and some of them are really deep, all these holes need to be filled back in. And the whole beach smoothed over. And the beach is, yeah, about this wide, the width of the room. So it's quite a bit uh, of territory to cover. I figured, oh, I'm gonna make myself useful. Right? And I'm out there every morning with the rake. Um, got a blister the first morning because I wasn't holding the rake, right? But anyways, I worked one day, and then two days, and three days. And during those days as I'm working, I'm thinking, well, I'm here as a guest, and I'm paying for my stay here. Maybe, maybe if I'm working and somebody sees me, somebody from the administration sees me, they'll think, oh, he's working, we'll give him a discount on the fees he pays for camp. And part of me was thinking, you know, maybe people will get up early and they're walking to breakfast or morning devotion, and they'll see, oh, there's Brother Jason working hard, right? He doesn't need to, but he's doing it. By the fourth day, I was tired. And, and then it was shrinking a little bit, so, so I took that as a sign from the Lord, you don't need to make the beach. The, the fifth day, it was Saturday, I figured, well, we're all leaving anyway, so. And, and so far, nobody's seen me and nobody said anything, right? This, this is our heart, right? I, I had the best of intentions, but there's this little bit of corner of my heart that became discouraged because nobody saw what I was doing. Nobody was coming and patting me on the back and saying, good job, you know? Um, and I, I tried to make it known, right? I went into Evan and said, did you enjoy how smooth the beach was this, this, this afternoon? He's like, no, it was kind of rough. I was like, well, I, I rake that, I made it smooth. We, we, we're, we're so into uh, thinking about what people see, right? We care so much about what people see, and, and the only times that we do or don't do things, many times is, is someone gonna see me, right? I'm gonna do this only when someone's watching so I get credit. If you're thinking about doing something bad, I'm gonna make sure I do it when no one's around, right? And I don't know, I don't know how many times we've offended the Lord in secret. I think we all have, right? And you know, as I was preparing this sermon, I was, I was having a hard time coming up with a good example for, for the negative, right? Because you know, you're all so lovely sitting here and. I can't imagine any of you doing anything really nasty. But, but I've been in situations, I've seen this happen in, in churches where people will gather in secret and try to discredit someone and they will bring false accusations in secret, right? They won't do it in front of the whole church because they're afraid of how the church will react. And we are just so full of nastiness inside. We're capable of it. Now, I don't think we're going to do it here. I hope. But... All of us, at such, to some degree, we're, we're capable of this. And, and, you know, people who do this, they do it in the name of doing good. They do it in the name of God. They do it in the name of religion. And 
I think, I think when we see this, when we see these religious leaders and what they're doing, it's easy to dismiss it and say, I would never do this, but I think it would behoove us to be un un constantly and honestly asking ourselves and asking the Lord, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Am I someone who would do this? Am I capable? Have I done this? Have I possibly done it before and not been aware of it? Am I capable of being deceitful, of being duplicitous? Am I, am I able to be committing these atrocious acts against brothers and sisters? Right? Saying something nasty about someone to someone else, but, you know, to their face would be really nice. Am I capable of being two-faced, being kind and gentle in public when all eyes are on me, but, but in private, I'm a whole different person? And this is really something we need to ask ourselves. You know, so that's the religious leaders. Right? And I think that kind of behavior, I think, is easy to spot. I think if we, if we just take some time, we're honest with ourselves, come before the Lord, I think we can spot these things. But let's move on. I want to take a look at the next group. The next group, they're the disciples. They've been following Jesus, they've been trying to learn, and they have learned some things from God's revelation. Right? And we see so often they sorely miss a point. So let's look at the disciples missing a point again. Okay. Verses 6 through 9. When Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. If you remember, when we looked at this account, I, I believe from the book of John, the, the oil that was poured out, it was worth how much? How many remember? Approximately. It was a year's worth of wages. Imagine you have a flask of oil worth a whole year's wages. That's a lot of money. And you just pour it all out, right? And the disciples see it. And it's, you know, look, think about this. At the beginning of the passage, well, what did Jesus just tell the disciples? In two days, after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man is going to be crucified. In two days, right? Jesus said, in two days, they're going to be crucified. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that the disciples should just be moping around and be gloomy all the time because of what Jesus said, but I do think there's, they should have weighed on their hearts. Right? To think about Jesus being taken away, but to speak with such callousness when love and adoration is being showered on Jesus, who's going to be taken away from them in two days. It baffles me that the disciples could speak like this. And in the other, uh, the other books, we see that it was mainly Judas who speaks this, because he wanted the money for himself. He had been stealing, right? But here in this account, at least, other disciples were also indignant in seeing this, right? Now, you know, Jesus, here at this time with the disciples, right, they are looking forward. And so perhaps it was still hard for them to comprehend. But for us, for us here, we have a different perspective, right? The disciples with Jesus, they were walking toward the cross. We are now past the cross. We are looking back, and so we know what Jesus has done already. We know Jesus has already gone to the cross and died for us. And so, so much more than we should be lavishing love and adoration on Him. All right. Now, when I look around the room, I see, you know, we're very well-mannered and practical people. I think practical very much like the disciples were, and maybe, maybe we are reserved. Reserved and not really given to displays of emotion. And in the same way, in the same way, we might say, why this waste? Why this waste? Why waste this tear on Jesus? Right? And, and I think, look, maybe, maybe we're not, you know, prone to public displays of emotion. But, you know, we, we might say, I, I'm just not an emotional person. I, I, I'm not built that way. Right? And I would, I would counter that with, look, come look me in the face and tell me that a person died for you. A person died for you to take your place 
and tell me that and then tell me you're not an emotional person. I think all of us would be moved, right? When we think about what Jesus did, he died for us. And so in reflection of that, you know, look, I'm, I'm not saying that Porsche like needs to start investing in huge boxes of Kleenex every week because we have to come in here and meet all the time. But I think we can, we can, when we think about what Jesus has done for us, I think we can allow ourselves to open up and, and be willing to lavish more praise on Him. And you would say, well, no, I already sing for worship. Good, that's good. That's a good first step. What about praying during breaking of bread to come and, okay, that, that's a good next step. Just simply to say thank you. Or, or maybe how about, saying out loud, I love you, Jesus. And this was one of the things that I had learned at camp. Um, you know, one, one of the evenings, um, the question was posed to some of the brothers and sisters there who had been, who had been well-versed, I would say, in loving the Lord and, and in being filled with the Holy Spirit. And one of the questions that was asked was, how do, you, how do you practice it? How does this work for you, for lack of a better term? One of the sisters said, I've always learned to be expressive of my love for Jesus, to say, I love you, Jesus. And I, I get it, I get it myself personally. I understand that to say that out loud, we're not used to that, right? We're used to being reserved. I can sing it in a song, but to say it, if there's a time of prayer, right? Just praying out loud is hard enough to just vocally say, I love you, Jesus. It's, we're not used to that, but I think it's something we can practice together as a church to say simply, Jesus, I love you. I think he died for us, right? And so how, how much we, we can be encouraged to, to express ourselves. I mean, look, um, today we have some married folks, we have those who are not married yet. Imagine, imagine, just imagine for a second that you're all married. I like to use marriage as an example, but it works. Imagine that you're married and this is not a happy example, but imagine you're at a point in your relationship where the relationship is on the brink of ruin. And the only thing that will save this relationship is for you, in front of everyone, to turn you to your spouse and say, I love you. And give her a hug, give him a hug and a kiss, whatever, whatever it is, to express publicly that affection, right? I'll, I'll tell you, if that's the one thing that it takes to save that marriage, I don't think he would tell me, I'm sorry, I'm not an emotional person. It, it, I'm just not built like that. No, you'll do whatever it takes to save that relationship. Right? In the same way, I think if we think about what Jesus has done for us, I think we can perhaps, again, be, be able to, look, it's, it's pr a lot of times it's pride that gets in the way. Right? I don't want to seem, I don't know, weak and emotional, because being emotional, unfortunately, is seen as a sign of weakness, right? I would say, hey, you know what? Stop thinking about what other people see and think. I mean, that was a problem with the religious leaders, wasn't it, right? Don't care about what other people think. And look, sometimes, you don't, un you don't realize this, but if you are the first person to say out loud, I love you, Jesus, Someone next to you might be thinking, I, I don't dare say it because it's awkward. But the minute you say it, you've broken the ice. When the first person says it, other people feel more comfortable. And so we can help each other, encourage each other to be more expressive in our love for Jesus. Right? And look, you know, some of you have seen at your weddings. I know you're not uncomfortable with expressing affection in public. So let, let's do it for Jesus. Right? Now... The next group, I want to jump down to the next group. And actually, it's only one person. Let's jump down to verse 14. Verse 14 to 16. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? So he knows. He knows that the chief priests of the religious leaders have been trying to kill Jesus, trying to find a way to get him. He comes and he, he wants a martyr. What do you, what will you give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought the opportunity to betray him. Jump down to verse 20. So, so the background's been set, right? Judas has arranged with the leaders 
in exchange for 30 pieces of silver, which incidentally is the cost of the life of one slave. I think this is significant that Judas betrayed Jesus for the cost of the life of one slave. So here the scene's been set. Judas has agreed with the leaders to betray Jesus. Now, verse 20. When the evening had come, he, Jesus, sat down with the twelve. Now, as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. So Jesus knows, and Jesus says to the whole group of them, One of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Verse 25, Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, You have said it. You know, we're looking here at Judas, one of the twelve disciples, and the disciples are close. They're very close to Jesus. They've been walking with him for three and a half years. Right? The way Jesus described it, the one who dipped his hand with me in a dish will betray me. This is a very close intimate relationship. When you eat together at the table, and, and during this time, they ate with their hands. Right? You take, I guess, some bread and you dip it in, in whatever sauce or dish. When you're dipping together, that's a closeness that you don't share with just anybody. And Jesus said, he who dipped his hand in this dish with me is going to betray me. This is how close Judas was. All the disciples were to Jesus. And you have to remember, right, Judas here, he's close, and he's had all the outward signs of being a believer. He's had all the outward signs. And remember, Jesus, when he called the 12 disciples together, he what? He gave them power and authority over all demons. It didn't say he gave only the 11. He gave them all power and authority over all demons to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And so Judas was out there preaching the gospel. He was out there casting out demons and healing the sick. Right? Outwardly, he looked just like one of the twelve. And he was doing everything just like one of the twelve. But remember what Jesus said. Right? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Right? Perhaps Jesus was speaking of Judas when he said that. Not just Judas, but included Judas in that. Right? When you get close to Jesus, look, when you get this close to Jesus, only one of two things can happen. When you get this close to Jesus, either you become wholly His, completely His, or you end up being alienated from Him. Why? Because what Jesus, when Jesus draws us to Himself, as He allows us to see the truth, as He allows us to see what He asks of us, when we start to see who He really is, Jesus really is very polarizing in what He asks. He asks for all. Right? And, and we either give our all, or we, sit, or we give up and say, I can't do this, Lord. Right? And you know, I've, I've come across people who, who would say that they were believers. Right? And, and this is the thing. There is no middle ground with Jesus. You, you can't say, I'm going to have one foot in and one foot out. I'm going to believe in you, Jesus, but I'm going to love the world. There is no middle ground. And I've come across people who said they were believers, and they loved the message of love, and they loved receiving blessings and benefits. But when they looked at what Jesus said, what the Word of God says about what is right and wrong, they couldn't take it. They couldn't take it, and they rejected the Word of God. And look, when you reject the Word of God, who are you rejecting? Jesus Himself, because Jesus is the Word of God. And so we come to Jesus, and look, you either accept Him all the way, or you end up rejecting him. And this is what happened to Judas, right? And we would look at Judas and we say, you know, this is even worse than those religious leaders, right? There's no way I would be like what those religious were. And there's no way, there's really definitely 
no way that I will be like Judas, where I'm close to Jesus and I say I love him and I follow him and I'm doing all these things, and yet I betray him. And I think, I think from the surface, if we look at just a literal betrayal, yeah, I, I, I don't think so, but I think, again, it behooves us to come to the Lord and ask, Lord, is it I? Am I, am I doing this? Am I following you on the outside, but inside I'm rejecting who you are? Am I saying with my mouth and worshiping, but inside I, I refuse to live the way you call me to live? Is this my condition? Am I being a Judas? Right? And I think we need to ask ourselves this. But the thing I want to leave us all with, the thing I want to leave us all with is Jesus, knowing that in two days the religious leaders were going to take him, they were going to try him, and you know they never really did find him guilty. They were going to try him and execute him unjustly. He knows that Judas is going to betray him he knows the way the disciples look at the love and adoration being showered on him. Knowing all this, knowing all this, verse 26, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my new covenant with you. Knowing full well what the people of the world wanted to do to him. The rejection and the execution that they had planned for him. Knowing full well even those closest to him, feeling like this love that showered on him is a waste. Those closest to him planning to betray him. Knowing all of this, Jesus gave of himself. He gave of himself and he says, this is my body to be broken for you. Take this and eat it in remembrance of me. This is my blood poured out for your sins to wash you clean. No, look, look, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I am so glad that I am not Jesus. Because if I was there that night and I knew what was going to happen, I would take the bread, break it, you ain't getting none of this. Because I know, I know what is in your hearts. I know none of you deserve what I'm about to do. So I'm, my body for me, my blood poured out, no, no, not for me, right? But Jesus, knowing all of this, right? It's not like it's some distant memory. This is happening now. As his hand dipped in the bowl with Judas's hand. Think about that. Yes, Judas was evil. There's a question of whether or not Judas was saved. I don't think he was. I don't know. That's, that's not the point. The point is, Jesus, knowing what Judas was going to do, Jesus went to the cross with Judas too. Do you know that? He went to the cross for everyone, all of us. He looked Judas in the eye as Judas said, Is it I, Lord? And Judas said, You, you said it right. And he went to the cross for him. And this is the Jesus that we worship. As he looked at each of us in our two-facedness, in our working to please men and not to please God, in our maybe sometimes small or big betrayals of Jesus and how we live, he saw all that at that moment when he was on the cross. He saw all that and instead of rejecting us, he said, I am going to take your sins upon myself as I go to this cross. And I am dying for you. This is the Jesus that we worship. And so again, I say, I think he's worth expressing our affections to him. I think he's worth perhaps being a little undignified sometimes and not worrying about what other people think. And today, as we, as we end the sermon, as we come to the Lord's table, think about, really think about what Jesus has done for us. And allow that to direct you in how you respond to him as you take the bread and come today. Let's close in prayer. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you loved us and you loved us to the end. You love us as we are, Lord. 
And I pray in our lives that we would learn to come and ask Lord, is it I? Am I being this? Am I being these religious leaders? Am I being the disciples and being stingy Lord, with how I love you? Am I Judas in my sins betraying you? But I also thank you, Lord, that when we come and we ask, is it I? You do not turn away from us, Lord, but you welcome us back with your arms wide open. And I thank you this morning for this love and for this reminder again that's set before us. Pray these things in Jesus' name.